And then Catherine Karibusana. Thank you very much, uh, Rose. Good afternoon, members. Um, always a pleasure to um, meet with you, engage with you. You know, when the elections happened, I was like, I need something to bring me back home. And by home, I mean back into women on boards. And this session is just doing, is doing just that for me. So I'm really, really happy to be here with you and particularly to listen to one of our own, Dr. Margaret Nyakango, who we are so, so proud of. Um, so proud of what the work she's doing in the public sector. And I do hope that as uh, Dr. Tari, you speak with us, you'll touch on some of those minefields and pitfalls and bear traps that perhaps you have found in the public sector that are not so common in the private sector or vice versa, um, so that we can learn from your journey as well. And ladies, I do hope that uh, you have uh, your pad re ready to take notes and to ask as many questions as you can so that we make this session as interactive as possible and so that we can take away as much as we can from our very own Dr. Nyakano. Thank you so much, and I'm looking forward to this session. Asante Rose. Thank you very much, Catherine. And for those who are joining us for the first time, Karibu, um, the session will run this way. We'll have about 45 minutes uh, where Dr. Tari will speak to us um, around the topic. We will then break into virtual rooms, and those rooms will be facilitated uh, by some co-hosts who I will introduce um, after Dr. Tari has spoken. And then thereafter, we'll come into plenary and wrap up. We should be able to finish by about 7.45, 8 o'clock this evening. So at this juncture, allow me to introduce our very special guest um, this evening. This is none other than Dr. Margaret Nyakango, who was appointed as the controller of budget in the Republic of Kenya. 4th of December 2019, to oversee and report on the implementation of budgets of the national and county governments to the National Assembly, Senate, county assemblies, and the executive on a quarterly basis. She holds a doctorate in business administration from the University of Liverpool, UK, and also has a master of business administration degree in strategic management and bachelor of commerce in accounting from the University of Nairobi. She is a certified public accountant and a practicing member of the Institute of Certified Public Accountants of Kenya. She's also a member of the Association of Women Accountants of Kenya and an active member of Women on Boards Networks with hands-on skills in corporate governance. She is a certified professional coach, has served on several boards, and in her free time, she plays golf, and loves reading factual um, materials. Uh, it was recent. Uh, Sorry, if you could please mute ourselves. Thank you. So Dr. Tari was recently awarded the chief of the order of the Burning Spear um, recommendation by His Excellency the President for her prominent role in national development matters. What a profile, what an evening. Dr. Tari Karibusana, to women on boards. Um, we're looking forward to hearing from you around board independence and why it is that it matters. Karibu Daktari, the platform is yours. Thank you, thank you very much, Rose. And thank you, uh, Chair Catherine, for the glowing tribute. It's always my pleasure to be here. Being, as you have heard, a member of the Women on Boards Network, which I joined way back. I think I'm one of the pioneers of the Women on Boards Network. So it gives me a lot of pleasure this evening to be of use to my very own, uh, to speak about a subject that I think is very passionate to us as women who aspire to be on boards or who already sit on boards, as I know. Now, as we go through this presentation, 
Rose, I would request that you put up, um, you can put up the slides because I believe that uh, I'm talking to a, a well-informed audience. I know that the ladies here are um, ladies who are actually ready, if not already on boards. But I would like to share just some of what I found as we were moving along. And if we can go to page slide three, Slide three, I'll start with slide three. In a manner of introduction, to say that we all know, I think this is, as we are now, it's common knowledge, practice has shown a strong link between corporate governance and growth and prosperity. And nobody dislikes growth and prosperity. Good governance encompasses the whole system of rules, structures, and processes by which entities are controlled and held accountable. Good governance, therefore, requires that a wide array of stakeholder interests be taken care of. So we also agree that a professional and independent board is more likely to safeguard a public entity from political interference and can also lead to more efficient operations through a well-defined strategy resulting in value for money to shareholders. Ladies, and gentlemen, I believe those who are listening, the comments I've just given are from Muongozo. And Muongozo is a document that was prepared through the efforts of the Institute of Public Certified Public Secretaries, the legally recognized professional governance body in Kenya. Indeed, our very own chair, Catherine Musakali was involved in the preparation of Mwangozo. And Mwangozo has then remained as the Bible of governance in the public sector. And I have to confess here that a lot of what we are learning tonight is due to the efforts of Mwangozo and the Institute of Certified Public Secretaries. Let's come back now to our constitution. If we can move to the next slide. And our constitution, we know that we have a devolved system of government where we have the national government and the counties as we know them. Now, under the national government, we then have the state corporations for which indeed Mwongozo was meant at the beginning. But when we look at the provisions of Mwongozo, we find that they are relevant to most of the public sector as we will see later on. Chapter 15 of our constitution provides for independent offices and commissions at national level. And further at the county level, we have county service boards, and we also have audit committees. So we are trying to see where we are coming from in terms of governance at both the national and county levels. Let's understand the role of a board. For those of us who have been trained in corporate governance, we know, next slide please Rose, an effective board is one that leads an organization to achieve its strategic objectives. A board should be composed of competent, diverse, and qualified members. 
Further, members should be capable of exercising objective and independent judgment. The board should have appropriate autonomy and authority to exercise its functions and should be accountable to the shareholders, whoever those are. A board must also act responsibly towards the stakeholders. A very, very important topic. So in the boards that we have, we have members that are called, um, that are not independent, and we have independent board members. So what's the distinction between the two? Independent board members have certain features. They must not be in the service of the national government or the county at the point that they are serving. They must not be involved with any associated companies in subsidiaries or any holding company associated with the body that has taken them up. Further, they must not have been employed in that the state corporation in any executive capacity in the last five years. In the public sector boards, as per the rules, at least one third of the members shall be independent. And we'll soon know how an independent member should be like. So how do we then define board member independence? An independent member is one that is not associated with any advisor, any consultant or senior staff, or even a significant customer or supplier in the state entity. Ladies, this is very, very important. The independent member must have no personal service contract with the entity or even with a member of the senior staff of the public entity. And further, that this board member is not a member of the immediate family of any persons that I've described above. So having looked at the board member independence, let us look at some of the attributes that we expect the independent board member to have. One is that they must act only in the best interests of the organization. That they must act honestly at all times and avoid conflict of interest. Independent members should exercise independent judgment and understand and accept collective responsibility at the board level. They should be able to devote sufficient time to board affairs, should regularly update their knowledge and also promote transparency at the board level at all times. We are still looking at more attributes. If we move to slide 10, the attributes of an independent board member include promoting teamwork. And that means that they should not work in silos. An independent board member should promote and protect the image of the organization in which they sit. They owe a duty to the organization, but not, and please note this, not to the appointing authority. Independent members owe a duty to hold in confidence any information that comes to them by virtue of sitting in those boards. And further, they should disclose at all times any real or perceived conflicts of interest 
and operate within an agreed framework. Independent members will seek independent advice, but only following an agreed procedure. And that means that really a lot is expected of independent members. So as we move on, we need to understand about board independence. We have spoken about the independent board member, but what does it mean for a board to be independent? Now for a board to be considered independent, it must have board selection practices that are in line with good corporate governance. Secondly, that political influence is not, political influence is not the reason that members are appointed to the board because political influence then means that independent independence is lost. And to help us in this, the constitution makes provisions that guide both independent commissions and offices, as well as state corporations on how to behave in the appointment of uh, independent board members. So, what is the structure then of governance as we have it in the public sector right now? We know that we have independent commissions and there are many, but I'll be giving an example of one. And I have chosen an example, a public service commission as one example of an independent commission. So what is it? that makes the Public Service Commission uh, comply with our definition of an independent commission. We know that the Public Service Commission is not under the control of any person or authority. This is as per Article 249 of the Constitution. The Public Service Commission has no political appointees. People are appointed on merit. Article 223, subsection 3, specifies that any of the members of the Public Service Commission must not have held office or stood for election as a member of parliament or county assembly in the recent past. Further, that they are not state officers and must be competent in the area for which they are appointed. This process of appointing commissioners to the Public Service Commission eliminates political interference and therefore strengthens the independence of the commission. If we can move on to the next slide, we will now see an example of an independent office. And I'm happy to use my own office as an example here. And I'm sure you'll be asking me more questions. But in the interest of time, we'll just look at a few provisions for independent offices. Now, the Office of the Control of Budget is established under Article 228 of the Constitution to oversee the budgets of both the national and county governments by authorizing withdrawals from public funds and reporting on budget implementation to both houses of parliament quarterly. However, you will note that as an independent office, the Office of the Control of Budget has no board of directors and is not under the direction of any authority. 
The terms of appointment for the office holder are very stringent and are all specified in the constitution. Further provisions on governance of uh, independent offices are outlined in the specific acts, like the control of the budget act and the public finance management act. There are only two independent offices in the country, and that is the control of budgets and the auditor general. The others are independent commissions and independent commissions operate just like boards, but independent offices are different from the commissions. Now at the county level, the governance system there also has several aspects. And I've taken the example of the county public service boards, which are established under section 57 of the County Government Act. These are mandated to develop and implement human resource policies and frameworks for the counties. These public service boards require independence, just like any other boards. However, you will wish to know that the process of appointment of the public service boards is that the governor appoints both the chair and the members with the approval of the county assembly thereby introducing an element of political influence. Appointees therefore to the public service boards, and maybe some of you have experienced this, is that the appointees owe their loyalty to the appointing authority, therefore losing their independence. The county public service boards lack autonomy, and this has led to loss of sound decisions because the appointees fear for their survival. We have also noted poor hiring decisions because of the influence that comes both from the executive and the county assemblies. As a result, expenditure on personnel cannot be kept in check. And this has led to a very ineffective form of financial management as far as the wage bill is concerned. We are all familiar with this and I've covered it a lot in my quarterly reports. Another form of governance that I looked at was the county assembly audit committees. In terms of independence, what can we say? Assembly audit committees must have three members sourced competitively and one of them will then become the chair. They have one nominee of the county speaker and then the audit committee reports to the county assembly, the same assembly that has appointed them. So it's up to us to then think, how do they practice their independence in such, in such an atmosphere? How about the county executive audit committees? These are supposed to be tools of governance and they're supposed to be independent and autonomous. However, the members, although they are supposed to be competitive, they are appointed by the governor and one of them then becomes chair. The governor nominates one senior officer from the staff and the same committee reports to the governor. 
So I'm challenging us, even as we listen, to say and to think in our minds, do we think this is independent? And can it give us the results that we expect of an audit committee? So perhaps I need to say what we expect of these audit committees. Let's move. What is an audit committee? An audit committee in the public sector is a committee composed of independent, non-executive directors charged with oversight functions to ensure, one, responsible corporate governance, to ensure a reliable financial reporting process, an effective internal control structure, a credible audit function, an informed whistleblower complaint process, and an appropriate code of business ethics. Ladies and gentlemen, you just had, I just highlighted how we appoint the audit committees at the county level. I'm wondering whether they can perform what I just listed there, those responsibilities. These same committees have the responsibility of creating long-term shareholder value while protecting the interests of other stakeholders. Really? But before we decide, I leave that to you to be the jury. So with those few challenges then, how can we strengthen public sector board independence? There are a few factors that I have picked and I'll bring out in this presentation. But of course, I believe that we will learn more. And the, uh, as we aspire to, to, to get into boards, we will be expected to bring out more ideas on how we can make public sector boards more independent. But one area that I felt is very, very important is clarifying the roles and responsibilities. These responsibilities are both fiduciary, the duty of care, the duty of loyalty, and monitoring senior management performance. Like I said, there could be more. In order to strengthen these boards, we must always have board evaluation. And board evaluation identifies the gaps in the mix of competencies and skills and specifies the profiles for new members who may not be already on board. These boards, if they are to be independent, must practice capacity building initiatives on changes in laws and governance structures. This is indeed a must do. There must be clear terms of reference for boards and subcommittees. Without clear terms of reference, meetings will be held, time will be wasted, and no governance will be taking place. Further transparent process of appointment. That process must be based on skills and competencies, not just on political loyalty or personal loyalties. Further, it's a good practice to maintain a database of qualified candidates that can form a pool of potential candidates for appointment on need basis. What more can I say? This is what the Women on Boards Network is doing right now, helping our country and helping the public sector boards become more independent. So ladies and gentlemen, why then do we need board independence? 
Why is it so important? So the most critical tools for improving corporate governance in the public sector have already been outlined. But when we look at transparency in board appointment processes that avoids political in, uh, interference, I believe that tap, that one takes the first position. It is very important that board appointment processes avoid political interference. That will have solved a large percentage of the loss of independence that we experience. Appointing professional boards with well-defined skill sets cannot be gainsaid because we need skills. We need skills within the board to add value. Thirdly, we should reduce the overall size of the boards and increase the number of independent members. And we have already defined what independent members are and what they do. Another very important one is capacity building. Mentorship and coaching of aspiring board members, again, cannot be gainsaid. Mwongozo, the document that specifies corporate governance uh, for the public sector specifies that at least one third of the boards must be comprised of independent members who must maintain their independence through the term of their service. They do not just go in as independents and then morph into dependents. Further, that the establishment and terms of reference of audit committees is also taken care of so that we have at least three independent non-executive directors. And we are saying this is both at national and at county level. The counties can also have independent members, members who come, who are, who are not subject to the governor or to the county assembly. The main roles and responsibilities must be set out in written terms of reference and that appointment, rotation, and renewal of terms of office be staggered so that at any one time, there are board members who remain with the institutional memory and that the whole board does not leave at the same time. So ladies and gentlemen, we have gone through a number of uh, factors. So on this penultimate slide, I now look back at what independence is all about. What is independence? Free from outside control, not subject to another's authority, not depending on another for livelihood, self-sufficient. Independent boards in the public sector are expected to have the features here. So my question to you, do you think they have them? And if not, what can we do as women on boards to improve independence in the public sector? Ladies and gentlemen, I rest my case. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, the county governments. Um, we're so used to hear a lot on the national government. So thank you for that wonderful presentation. Um, 
Ladies, I can see that uh, the comments are coming in and yes, we shall be able to share some of your questions with Dr. Curry in a very short while. Um, but perhaps before we break into our rooms, um, Dr. Tari, from your perspective, um, yes. you know, having uh, overseen, um, you know, several sectors and sat on, on boards, especially within private sector, public sector, what are some of these landmines that, you know, as members of women on boards looking to join the public sector, what are some of the things that, you know, we should be cognizant of um, as we pursue interest? Okay, um, I have covered a bit of that, but one of the landmines that is very, very obvious is the manner in which one gets appointed to the board. If one gets appointed to a board without the right qualifications and without the right training, it means that from the word go, they are going to be at a disadvantage. And what that means is that the independence is compromised from the word go. So uh, if you go in when you are already at a, a, a disadvantage, then it's unlikely that you are going to recover when you are already within the board. Because then once the people notice that you, you don't know your, your staff, I mean, you can't contribute productively, then already, you know, you, you are just going down and you might find yourself having the role of just uh, preparing tea, which should never be the case. So being qualified, properly qualified and properly appointed are very, very important aspects for us who aspire to go to boards. Yes, Rose. Thank you, Doctor. Yes. Thank you for that. I think the second question is: We all know that appointments are political um, in some cases. So, where that is the case, um, how do you maintain that independence while balancing the different um, stakeholder in? What would be Okay. Yes, Rose, I hope you can hear me. Yes, you can. Yes. So I, I was saying that um, you are talking about political appointments, but if you see the provisions of Mongozo, it is that. Um, appointees actually should be qualified for the offices that they hold. For a long time, we know that polit uh, there used to be political appointments. But these days, even when they are political, it is very, very important that uh, the appointees have the qualifications for what they are going to do. And how, how is this being achieved? I will tell you, in modern Kenya, that is after the 2010 constitution, it is now mandatory for board positions to be advertised and for the appointees, for the potential appointees to give their CVs so that the CVs are then matched with the need that is within the board. Now, I do know that some people may get board appointments because of uh, political allegiance, but I think we are slowly moving out of that era. I used to see, you know, even illiterate people just being appointed to boards, but that's no longer the case. That is no longer the case. So we really, we must prepare ourselves because Kenya now is becoming different and we are no longer going to, to just uh, depend on uh, whom we know. Yes, Rose. Mm. Okay, thank you, Dr. Terry, for that. I'm sure we'll have a bit more time uh, during 
breakout sessions to be able to interact a bit more with this topic. Okay. So at this juncture, um, I think in Thai, we are ready for uh, the breakout sessions. And me to introduce um, the co-facility Alice Irungu, who's a director of Conscious Works, a coaching and training consulting company, and has worked in various capacities, sitting as a board member for various institutions. Mm -hmm. We also have Dr. Jen Yokabin Jugona, who's currently the director of corporate services at a private university in Kenya and sits on the university's management board and works closely with the university's governance body as well as the University Council and Board of Trustees. And our last co-facilitator is Rhoda Mura, um, who will also be introducing herself in the virtual rooms. So we'll spend about um, 15 minutes in each virtual room and Dr. we to another so that the members can be able to engage and interact with you and ask some of those hard questions that perhaps uh, we may not have been able to do uh, within the main plenary. So can I please um, send us into our rooms and we shall be able to engage that in there. Surely um, a session with Dr. Margaret and the rest of you members, really, really engaging, I'm so pleased. We're all able to attend today's session. Okay, so perhaps just a quick recap from the two groups, and we'll just give you two minutes to sort of highlight the three things that came out of the discussion that you feel were the highlights, you know, of the session. And we'll start with you, Alice. I know you ably led your group. I managed to attend some of the, um, you know, conversations. So what are the three things that sort of jumped out for your group? All right, uh, thank you so much, Rose. And um, for us, the three things that uh, really, really like came out, maybe the, the main one was the power of emotional intelligence in, uh, in our meetings, you know, just understanding where you come in and uh, like just Dr. was sharing with us before we came to this room, you know, understanding where do you avoid um, certain issues? How do you mitigate? How do you handle them? Emotional intelligence will open for us doors, will help us know how to manage particular situations. So that, that one came out so strongly, the power of emotional intelligence. The other thing that came out is, um, there's some things that cannot be avoided, which is the in-house politics. So it's not a matter of avoiding, but understanding and managing how do you handle that. And then we also had very good discussions when it comes to board independence. So when it gets to a place where you feel you're maybe getting compromised or you're not in a you're not understanding each other as uh, board members. So what do you do with that? The same thing came up, the power of emotional intelligence, understanding you know, the power of empathy. So how can I bring these people who are on this end to see things my way? How can I be able to influence this decision, not uh, by maybe creating friction, more friction within the group, but making sure that you know what i understand their interest and how do i talk to them in a language that they're going to see me more of an ally than an enemy those are our three main takeaways i don't know whether we have someone from our group would love to add something if our two minutes are not over <laughs> excellent alice thank you so much um interesting perspective especially around the emotional intelligence one Asante yeah. Sandu, that group. thank you Dr. Jane, your group. Thank you, Rose. Um, we did have a secretary in our group and I'll give her a chance if you allow me to use some of that two minutes. Uh, the most interesting thing we did is that we had a case study and, and one of our members said, uh, we are in a real environment. And uh, two case, one case study was uh, quite, uh, we, we tried to stay independent around it. It's about the IABC, but just trying to think of uh, if you were a board member at this point, that 
in, in time with all that's happening. And that was quite interesting. Um, we did have other great discussions and I will ask Naomi and Jerry to pick those three for us so that it's a good recap from what came from our group. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Rose. I think the main takeaway for group one was the first thing is honesty as you address the issue of conflict of interest, uh, being able to, 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 to believe, to stay on your belief and uh, also manage the interests of the various stakeholders. So honesty and integrity became, becomes very key. And of course, there was the issue, the main work of the board is uh, strategic, to ensure the strategic objective of the organizations are being met and ensuring that the performance is being measured, that of the organization and also for the individual board members. And finally, it was about the case study on independence, but it might come at a price. I think those were the main issues, thank you. Rose, uh, that's from our group, thank you. Thank you. Interesting around, you know, the fact that, yes, sometimes independence does come with a price, but also interesting to hear that, you know, Dr. Margaret said, you don't quit. And she was ready to mediate, um, you know, some of the areas uh, that were difficult. So thank you so much, ladies. It's been such a great session and we couldn't have done it without you. We really don't take your time for granted um, this evening. And so allow me to invite Marcy to, um, move a vote of thanks to Dr. Margaret. But before she does, Dr. Margaret, any parting shots from yourselves, perhaps something that we may not have picked um, during your session? Uh, thank you once again, Rose. Uh, not really. I'm, I'm happy that the ladies picked these takeaways. I'm very, very impressed. They were listening and they were engaged. And I do believe that um, as they continue with uh, this mentoring process, that open their skills, and when they finally get to those boards, they'll be raising the, the, the flag very, very high. So what the Women on Boards uh, Network is doing is so great, I cannot even, I cannot put it in words. It is something we have been lacking, and it is something that is going to fill a very, very large gap. I mean, look at, and like we said, somebody has mentioned the IEBC, look at how many ladies are now getting into leadership. That tells you that something is happening, that the ladies have realized they are, that they have what it takes and um, they have risen to the occasion. And next time, Check this space, there'll be 50%. Thank you very much. Just encouraging everyone to keep at it. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for that. So Marcy, would you like to move the vote of thanks? Uh, thank you so much, Rose, for giving me this opportunity. And I know um, this has been quite the session. We wanted it to go for longer, but today is a working week day. <laughs> so we have to go to work, otherwise we'll not pay our taxes. So of course, I'd like to give my extreme vote of thanks, of course, to the guests today, Dr. Nyakango, and of course, her being the controller of budget, and of course, uh, seeing a woman in such a position, uh, it actually puts faith in us, especially in this time that we've seen more women offering themselves in uh, elective seats and more women actually not going for the gender affirmative seats, both in the ex executive and also elective politics. So having a woman mm -hmm. at the head of a very uh, serious position, which is an independent position, is of course very encouraging. And seeing of course the comments that we've seen about uh, women, what will the country change? And we are saying the wave has started and the wave starts with the preparation. And therefore, thank you so much uh, to Dr. Nyakango for preparing us, especially in this time that clearly the, the ship has docked off. So people have yes. to get to the program. Of course, I'd like to thank uh, our board at Women on Boards Network left, led by Katrin Musakali for always organizing these sessions because sometimes also that boys club that he said imaginary, this is now our girls club as it were, where we now come and discuss issues that are pertinent and specifically affecting women in these leadership positions. And as we say, uh, sharing is caring. So that we also hear from those who've been there before, those who aspire to be there, and even those who've just started this journey. And of course, uh, the, my fellow ladies, 
those who are already in boards, those who are new in boards, those who are aspiring in board to be in boards. Thank you so much for attending this session and for showing up on a weekday. And just to cap the highlights, we've learned that emotional intelligence is key. We have to invest in the value of conflict management. When you're in a board, read your papers and competence must be demonstrated because you see one thing that has been seen even in this so-called patriarchal society, which has changed, is that anytime a woman makes a mistake, has it seen to be 10 times more. So you have to be 10 times more competent, which is something that has come out from the group discussions, as well as the value of honesty, integrity, and stakeholder management. Now that even we've seen the value of stakeholder management, even at the highest level with these elections we just come uh, from. So let's understand also the strategy of the organization and always limit yourself to the strategy and remind yourself of the values. Other than that, again, I'd like to extend my thank you to uh, Dr. Nyakango and to those of us who join her in the executive, uh, kindly hold the conversations we've had today well. And also everyone here, I wish you a lovely evening and let's maintain the peace in these elections. And we look forward to having you all at the next section. Thank you. Back to you, Rose. Thank, thank you. you very much, um, Basi. Asante sana. Um, I think uh, as part of that, you know, let me also thank uh, the members of the Secretariat, led by Mrs. Wanga, Hannah, Kantai, for always working behind the scenes to ensure that we are set up and that we are ready to go. Um, just to highlight a few um, programs or initiatives that uh, Women on Boards is running, we have the uh, Junior Membership Program Webinar on Leadership Fundamentals. This will be happening on the 25th of August from 6.30 p.m. And, um, you know, boys of 13 and girls of 13 years and older, you know, are welcome to attend. Interesting space to begin getting them into those leadership positions. We also have the corporate governance training um, between the 5th and the 9th of September. So please sign up. Part of what uh, Daktari mentioned is really competence around uh, corporate governance. And this is an excellent um, session for you to be able to upskill yourself. We have the ninth Women on Boards Network Annual Conference, which will be taking place on the 21st and the 22nd of October. This will be out of town. I assure you, it will be nothing but you know, an absolute conference that you must be able to attend. So please dare us that and join us for that conference. Um, the last initiative that we have as well this year is the Women on Boards Award for 2022. You are aware that uh, we held our first one last year, which was quite a success. And so we are requesting ladies to put up your hand, tell us some of the good things that you're doing because we know you're doing them within your spaces and come and join us for this award. So the entry closes on 31st of August, um, you know, this month. So please raise your hand. And if you're not participating, we're also looking for volunteers to help us with sponsorships um, and to really get this going. We want as many ladies to be able to participate in the Women on Boards initiatives because this is your space. So on that note, um, thank you very much for joining us this evening. We look forward to seeing you in our next um, mentorship session. And Kantai will be able to share that information um, in due course. Asante Nisana, God bless and good night. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Good night. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.